This is a great story of a patriot. If you're a Civil War historian, you may have heard of him. But the general story has somewhat been lost uh, for the average person. A strong Vincent was born around 1837, and their family moved in from Waterford, which was the county seat. His family was well off. His father is a successful manufacturer. At the age of 14 is a good example of the kind of person he was. He decided he had enough of school, and he said to his father, I don't want to go to school anymore. I want to be active. I want to be involved. Enough book learning. And his father said, okay, but nobody is lo nobody loafs. Nobody is idle around me. You're going to work in the foundry. After two years in the foundry, he decided that maybe that's not what he wanted to do. He came out of the foundry and ended up working for his father in the finance department, but now realized that he needed education. And so he went off to ultimately Harvard. At Harvard, he was a very good student, but not an outstanding one. He was about in the middle of his class. Um, he, however, was everybody's friend. Everybody wanted to get to know him. He was one of these natural leaders that is likable, that is, people are drawn to him. He's decisive, he's uh, personable, and he's a gentleman. But when he came out, he became a lawyer. Moved back to Erie, and in 1861, only a couple years after he got out of college, suddenly the Civil War broke out. And as an ardent patriot, he knew there was only one thing he could do. The first regiment that he got involved in from Erie, Pennsylvania, went to Pittsburgh, but it was only, they were only serving for three months, and they were mustered out after three months, and so he came home. Most men would have felt that he had done his duty. But a new regiment was being formed in Erie. And so he joined that regiment. And he writes to his wife shortly before the climactic battle of Gettysburg that if he were to die, he could imagine no greater glory than to die in the defense of the United States flag. No greater glory than to die on the soil of Pennsylvania in behalf of this great flag. The war was not going well, as you know, and Lee had decided to invade Pennsylvania in hopes of ending the war with one big victory. And so Vincent was a part of Meade's army that was attempting to get between Lee and Washington in 1863. And so this climactic battle was developing, although no one expected to occur at Gettysburg. And so in the battle that began to develop in, in July of 1863, the two armies collided by mistake, actually. Neither one expected to be fighting there. Both advanced elements ran into each other in this small town. On the second day, and this is the climactic moment of Vincent's life, and actually, I believe, of the Battle of Gettysburg, and he saw a man on a horse bringing orders looking frantically for a commander to give the orders to because Little Round Top, which was the site of the Confederate attack, although no one was sure that was going to be the case, was the end of the Union line. By God, it was absolutely undefended. One of the people in Meade's command looking at the battle maps saw that it was not covered and sent orders to cover it immediately. But the person who brought the orders couldn't find the man he was supposed to give it to. Vincent saw him frantically riding around looking for the guy and said, what are your orders? Give me your orders. And the orders were to defend the top. He said, well, I will take the responsibility of defending that top. And he moves his men, over a thousand, to the top of Little Round Top. At the very moment the Confederates come out of, little, uh, out of what was called Devil's Den, ready to attack, there was Vincent putting his men into position on the top. They attack only minutes after Vincent puts his men into position. So his placing of those men without the orders, directly, he did it on his own, did it without any authority, saved the day because those guys beat back the attack. However, unfortunately, the Confederate attack was fierce and part of the line began to buckle. This was late in the afternoon on the 2nd. And Vincent, seeing 
that part of his line was starting to cave in, rushed over to that side, and he had his wife's riding crop in his hand. He didn't have a sword, he just had his wife's riding crop from the horse, and he was standing on a rock, and he was saying to his men, hold your position, hold your position, and he had the riding crop in the air, and he was a perfect target for a sniper. And they nailed him with a shot, shot to the abdomen to prove fatal a couple days later. Joshua Chamberlain, who had been under Vincent, they had developed a very close friendship, who was in charge of one end of that line, took over when Vincent was, was mortally wounded. Vincent didn't die right away, he was carried to the back. Chamberlain took over, and then later in the afternoon, an hour, within the next hour, Chamberlain saw that his men were running out of ammunition. And he knew that another charge or two, they might break through and take the top. And so Chamberlain decides, and he was a man of the same quality as Vincent, our only choice here is to attack. And so he gives the order for his men to charge down the hill with bayonets because they were running out of ammunition. And as he charges down the hill, they come down screaming and yelling with bandits. The Confederates, now tired from a long day's march and then the fight, were completely startled to see these madmen coming at them, and they panicked and ran. And that's how Little Round Top was saved. And Chamberlain goes on, by the way, to live for another 40, 50 years. He becomes a political figure, he becomes a governor, he becomes a college president. He tells the story over and over, and eventually he tends to emerge as the hero because he lived to tell the story. Vincent, who died and whose body was eventually brought home, uh, was a hero in Erie, but to the world, the story was not as dramatic as Chamberlain's charge down the hill. We had a celebration in 1995 of the 200 years of Erie's history the bicentennial of the community. And one of our goals was to remember some of the heroes of the community. Vincent was a hero that we felt had been sort of forgotten, except for the high school named after him. There was no memorial to him around the community. So we decided to build one. That's what you see behind us. Vincent had a wonderful career ahead of him. He was a natural leader. He was a wealthy man. He was a lawyer by profession he would have become a major leader in this community. He could have easily avoided serving in the way I've already explained, but three times he goes back. That's the kind of patriotism, the kind of commitment to country, the kind of commitment to a cause that every country needs. He was an exemplar then to people who believe that a cause is more important than an individual's private profit or private interests. And so heroes are critical to the young. Heroes in history are critical to point the way to others. Because if we're not willing to give in behalf of the common good, we soon have no common good.